It is common in our culture that when somebody passes on from this life, we celebrate it through a memorial, a wake, some type of tribute to the life they led. And in those moments, we often hear people say, wouldn't it be nice if they got to hear all these things while they were still alive? Well, if you've been watching my YouTube channel over the last few weeks, you may have picked up that I've been struggling with a severe health situation with my father. He's 84 years old and the week before Christmas he checked himself into the hospital and they told him had he waited even a few more hours he would have been dead. He's been dealing with some very intense health issues since and we don't know how much longer he will be with us. It may be a matter of months, it may be years, we don't really know. But it has given me a lot of time to reflect on the man who raised me, who helped create me. And while I was planning and recording other video topics, I, I found my heart wasn't in it. I felt instead I needed to talk about my dad. And perhaps this is a little bit different than a normal video I would post. But sometimes when your heart is calling you to share something, then you have to listen. So I hope you'll oblige me in listening to the story as I know it, which may or may not be entirely factual, it's the stories I've heard, and a celebration of the man who made me me. So Charles Frank Strauss was born in the summer of 1939, and he was born into not the easiest of circumstances. Not only was the country still recovering from the Great Depression, but he was born into a set of parents who, well, to be quite frank, I don't even know if they were married, I don't even know if they loved one another. But I do know that his biological father left shortly after his birth and had no interest whatsoever in connecting with him or my father's mother. He and his mother Barbara lived in a cold water flat tenement building in Chicago, which is not an easy city to live in, especially at that time. My father could remember waking up in the middle of the night and seeing the floor moving, and by moving, coming to realize that it was just encrusted with cockroaches. I do not know much about the story of his mother. I do know that she did not seem to particularly want to be a mother. For weeks at a time, she would drop him off at the local orphanage, either directly or indirectly telling him the message, you are not wanted. And then when my father was only 12 years old, he would watch her die in his arms from a fatal heart condition. He was then taken in by his mother's boyfriend, a janitor slash crook, who was both abusive and very much always running from the law. By the time my father would leave high school early at 16 to go join the Air Force, he would have attended 12 different schools. I wanna just point out that this is a pretty impossible situation for a child to be born into and have any chance of thriving in life. The amount of trauma, the amount of pain that his young soul must have had to endure during this challenging, rejection-filled, abandonment-filled time is daunting. To even survive such circumstances is purely heroic. No one expected him to achieve anything in his life. But my father did have one family member, an aunt I believe, who said, you're gonna fool them all, Charlie. You're gonna be the one to get out of here. His stint in the Air Force did not last long. Early on, he caught strep and then caught it again shortly thereafter. Continuing on with his training and not going for treatment, the strep virus spread to his heart and caused lasting heart damage he would be discharged from the Air Force for his heart injury. I do not know much about the next few decades of his life, his 20s and 30s and early 40s. I do know that he was very intent on proving his value to society. I know that he struggled against his unfortunate childhood to show that he was a man of worth and means and validity. During those years, he would go on to create one of the most successful and profitable insurance agencies in the Midwest. He would be a self-described bit of a player wearing full-length fur coats and diamonds and gaudy jewelry galore. He drove a Rolls-Royce Phantom. He would host lavish parties every Friday night at the Blackstone Hotel in downtown Chicago. And he was notorious for having dozens and dozens of girlfriends. He was somebody who was very much showing that I'm okay. I, you can 
grow up in the slums and grow up to be somebody amazing, a success in the eyes of the world. In his early 20s, he would enter his first marriage, one that would not work out, but would give him two sons. Unfortunately, he would not get to raise them as much as he would have liked, only seeing them every other weekend, according to the custody hearings. And then a short-lived second marriage that lasted only about six months. And then finally, in his mid to late 40s, meeting my mother, and less than a year later, they would find themselves married. The time around my birth was not an easy one for him. A few years prior, while partnered with my mother, his heart condition from the strep virus meant that he would become one of the first Americans to receive an artificial heart valve, something that should only last for 15 to 20 years maximum, but here we are practically 40 years later and he still has that initial heart valve in good working order. His business he was so proud of, he would lose entirely. He would lose his insurance license and go bankrupt. In the words of my father, he was too trusting of people people who didn't deserve it, and always wanted to give someone a second chance. When I was little, my dad struggled financially and professionally. He struggled to get his feet again, and years later would admit that he ended up in a multi-year depression. Despite all this, he always tried very hard to show up as a good father figure to me. My mother tells stories about him when I was little, no matter how tired he was, he would come in, take off his jacket and tie, and get on the floor and play with me. Some of my earliest memories of my father involve him dragging me to public libraries where he would host little workshops on becoming a better person and self-help. I remember him even as early as probably nine or ten years old giving me books like How to Win Friends and Influence People or Think and Grow Rich, some of the early books in the self-help genre that became bestsellers. In fact, years later, I can remember an astrologer telling me that I might have an inclination to enter my father's line of work, and my initial reaction was absolutely not, I will never do insurance. But in hindsight, perhaps instead, what she meant was that I would be inclined to help other people on their journeys much like he did. My father, throughout his life, has been far from a perfect person, as are none of us. But one of the things I can say is that he has tried. He has tried immensely hard to improve in many ways, to be a good man, to be a good father, and be a good provider. The thing he says that broke him out of his depression was when in high school, I brought back my first college brochure and he saw the price tag. He wanted to make some snide remark, but instead he remembered that he had always promised that if I had worked hard in school, he'd find a way to pay for me to go to college. Wanting to keep his word to me, he closed his mouth and found a way to make that happen. When I started my coming out journey, he did not initially want to talk about it. And it wasn't until I introduced my parents to my now husband, the first man either of them had ever met that was significant in my life. And I can remember walking him through a courtyard to an outdoor pavilion where we were meeting for Italian food. And my father melting within just a few moments from looking gruff and a little standoffish to being exuberant and joyful. By the end of the dinner, he very notably said, gosh, Anthony, I couldn't love you anymore if you were a blonde with big tits. And then went on to joke, Haha, you better be careful, or I'm gonna steal you away from my son. Most notably for me, in the last two or so years of my life, my father has shown up for me in a remarkable way. When I've struggled with some intense things, he has shown up for me with nothing but love and kindness, admiration and compassion. Quite frankly, the best part of my relationship with him has been these last couple of years. And now as he's entering the final, probably, chapter of his life, the final stories that will be told about him, I have been reflecting on my experiences from the time I was little till now with him. There have, of course, been moments where I have raged against my father or felt disappointed or heartbroken, as we all do for the people we care about in our life from time to time. But those aren't the stories I necessarily want to tell at this moment, because the truth is, People exist for us in the stories we tell of them. And we can tell about the areas where they tried, the areas where they strove, the areas where they hoped to do better. To see their better angels, to see their good intentions, to see that while fallible and fully human, they perhaps strove for something greater. My father has always been an intensely spiritual man, somebody who I would say felt a deep connection and relationship with the Almighty. Growing up, he was always inclusive of non-traditional thought and ideas. He was one of the first who brought to me the idea of reincarnation, something he still believes in. 
He was one of the first who brought forward the idea of spiritual energy, sensing the history of things and objects through touching them, through touching someone and knowing more about their story. He has always encouraged me to put a connection with the divine and spirit central to my life. And as I look at the life I've cultivated now, I see the journey I'm exploring reflected in the actions he's taken in his life. In so many ways, it is so fair to say that I wouldn't be the man I am today if it weren't for my father. And no matter what, no matter how angry he might have been at me, or disappointed, or fearful, he has never made me feel anything but loved. He has never been cruel, or vindictive, or malicious. He's not always understood me. He's sometimes had some very colorful statements to make about my choices or who I am. But he's always made it very clear that he has loved me immensely. I can remember even being a little boy and just feeling that love, feeling my dad pat my head and rub my shoulders and tell me, sometimes multiple times in an afternoon, how much he loved me. I am so proud to call myself his son. Some cultures believe that we choose our families before we're born into them. Whether or not that's true, I am deeply honored to call myself Charles Strauss's son. I am deeply privileged to say that some great part of what I know to be true in this life and in my purpose comes from the example and the inspiration he has provided for me. And though he, like all of us, has had missteps and mistakes, things of which he probably could have done better and maybe he's not the most proud, the story I want to hold for my father is that of a man who was born into impossible circumstances, who strove to find fulfillment in the world and sometimes found it and sometimes not, but lived a life of integrity. He lived a life trying to do his best. And whether he met any arbitrary standard set upon him, I am honored to have borne witness to his life. None of us will live a perfect life. None of us will be faultless. But for someone who loves us to say, they did the best they could with the circumstances they were given. They tried very hard always to come from love to come from understanding and offer something of value, well, I frankly think that's tremendous. And however many days, weeks, months, or who knows, maybe years, I get with this man, I am grateful. So though this video may not mean much to anyone else, while my father is still alive, it's my opportunity to say, thank you, I love you, I see you, and I'm honored to be your son. And thank you for taking a moment to listen and let me share his story. My name's Kaylin, and this is Ecstatic Self. And in a similar way, I strive to show up every day as best as I can to offer something of value, to offer perhaps a few insights, a few gestures, a few ideas that will make your day just a little bit better and your journey just a little bit easier. Thank you for your time.